Welcome back to the Justice River exercise. Next up is Dr. Thomas Harder testifying about groundwater hydrogeology. And presiding will be hearing officer Susan Joseph Taylor from Nevada. And cross-examining Dr. Harder will be Joan Marchioro from the Washington Pollution Control Hearings Board. Let's listen now. Thank you, let's be on the record. Welcome, Dr. Harder. Um, you have been stipulated and agreed to as an expert for the court, but would you please give us a little bit of your experience that is relevant to this case? Thank you, Your Honor. My name is Thomas Harder. I'm professor at the Mark Twain University of Water Proverbs, uh, where I've been teaching for 20 years on matters of groundwater hydrology and groundwater modeling. I'm also very involved in uh, providing through cooperative extension outreach to the public and education through short courses. Um, the research that we have to be doing in my group has been focusing on groundwater issues, groundwater quality and groundwater quantity issues in agriculture, including conjunctive use and integrated modeling of groundwater and surface water resources in agricultural, primarily irrigated agricultural regions. And just for my education, doctor, would you please explain to me the difference between a hydrogeologist and a hydrologist? That's an excellent question. Um, traditionally, hydrology was taught as part of a civil engineering program, and so civil engineers tend to primarily work on surface water issues where they can do lots of construction. And so in a traditional sense, hydrology is very focused on stream flows and the relationship between stream flows and precipitation and reservoir operation. Um, a hydrogeologist typically comes out of the geology program and knows a lot about the subsurface and is very focused on groundwater and its relationship to geology. But we have um, a number of programs, academic programs in this country that have actually taught or teaching hydrology as an integrated science of water that integrates surface water and groundwater, water chemistry and water physics and water biology. Thank you. Would you please explain to the court some of the basic principles of hydrology and groundwater hydrology, specifically how they're relevant to this case? Okay, if you could please do I think you have the, the power. We need to put up the PowerPoint. Oh, Catherine, hello. If it may please Bennett. the court. <laughs> All right, you can get real quick. This one. So since you have a very complex matter to decide on, I thought perhaps we start by I'm very briefly going over some basic questions on understanding how groundwater actually works. What is it? Where does it go? Um, and how does it connect to surface water? Groundwater is part of the hydrologic cycle. Um, we have precipitation onto the land. On the land surface, water decides whether it wants to run off into a stream, whether it wants to percolate into the subsurface and then move on into a groundwater body from where it then typically moves back into a lake or a stream and ultimately back to the ocean. Um, groundwater is water that completely fills pore space between sediment particles or soil particles or in fractures in rock. Um, I like to use the analogy of a flower pot. A flower pot, when you fill it with dirt, is full, yet you are able to pour water into that flower pot, and if you hold the thumb at the bottom of that flower pot, the pore space in that flower pot, in the soil in that flower pot, will fill with water. And that, that is water that we call groundwater. Um, groundwater can occur in various kinds of sediments. It can occur in, in sediments that are themselves porous and within that pore space hold water. It can occur in, in, in caves and it can occur in, in rock fractures in mountains. Um, depending on where it is, it occurs um, um, in higher or smaller amounts and it can move faster or slower. Um, a couple of terms that I want, wanted to introduce as well, um, we will talk about today, is soils uh, develop usually at the land surface, at the top of what we call the vetus zone or unsaturated zone. The water table is that uh, place where, uh, the, where that separates the moist soil from the completely saturated sediments. And the, um, the question of where groundwater flows is we can answer that by looking at a ball uh, that 
that moves down a hill, it's not moving uphill, it's not moving sideways, the ball is going to roll pretty much along vertical, um, in perpendicular to the elevation contour lines on this hill. Similarly, when we draw elevation contour lines of the water table, it will tell us in which direction groundwater flows. Groundwater generally flows, and I'm, I'm somewhat generalizing, um, in the direction perpendicular of these contour lines. These are contour lines of the water table, not of the land surface, from higher water table to lower water table, higher pressure to lower pressure. And the other piece that we need to know in understanding groundwater flows is how fast groundwater flows. Here, a quick thought experiment. If we fill this column with sand and we have a, a beaker with a fixed water level on one end, uh, putting some pressure on this side of the sand, another beaker with less pressure on the other side, we'll have some water flowing through the sand. And if this is a fairly coarse sand or gravel, we would expect there to be quite a bit of water flowing through that soil column. Now, if I was to replace the sand with clay, then intuitively I wouldn't expect that much water to flow through that soil column. The property that separates clay from sand in this case is what hydrogeologists call the hydraulic conductivity or the transmissivity of the sediment material. Are those two the same? Those, those are technically different. The transmissivity actually is, is related to the hydraulic conductivity by multiplying the hydraulic conductivity with the thickness of the aquifer. So it's the, the total aquifer thickness. Um, but they, they, they address the same property of the material, which is how fast does it let groundwater flow through the pores? Higher hydraulic conductivity, higher transmissivity means water flows faster through this pore space, or if it was a rock, through fracture space. Lower hydraulic conductivity means um, uh, it flows slower. And uh, we heard earlier testimony about California now permitting well logs to be public. The main information that comes from well logs is this description of materials that we hydrologists, hydrogeologists can use to determine what materials are in, our, in, in the subsurface, where are our aquifers, and also get an idea of how fast groundwater may flow there. Another thing that determines the speed of groundwater is how fast this water table drops from one side of this column to the other. If I have less water table decline from one side to the other, water's not gonna flow as fast, just like that ball on the hill, it's not gonna roll down the hill as fast if the hill is flatter. So the flatter the water table, the slower, the slower water movement. Um, so fundamentally, the bottom line is groundwater flows based on the hydraulic conductivity of the materials that it flows through and based on the slope of the water table or the pressure in the aquifer system. This is what hydrogeologists call Darcy's Law, based on an engineer that came up with this in the mid-1800s. So different materials, different aquifer materials across the United States will generate uh, different groundwater speeds at large scale, at smaller scales. We have lots of different geologic systems that contain enough groundwater that can be conveyed to wells or to springs or to streams. We have limestones with significant openings that were um, dissolved. We have sandstones that, have, that are porous enough to actually hold significant amounts of groundwater that can also move through sandstones. But much of our water is in sands and gravels. That's where water flows the easiest. And we have many sand and gravel aquifer systems, everything in blue and ye yellow here on this map, here in the United States. In California, I like to call our large aquifer systems sediments that are sitting in bathtubs. Where the bathtub walls are the mountain ranges around, for example, the Central Valley, where we have the Sierra Nevada on one side and the Coast Range on the other side. And that bathtub continues under the sediments that have filled the Central Valley. And these sediments are filled with groundwater. So if I do a cross section through here, um, what you see is, you see this bathtub, which are the mountain ranges, which themselves are fractured in some places can hold and move a lot of water. Um, in many places, they, they, the water in these mountain, fractured mountain blocks don't really move very fast relative to how fast they can move in the sediments. Um, and these sediments are filled with water that's been coming from recharge that comes out of streams. When these streams come out of the mountains, they hit these gravel bars and sandbars, and, and water can percolate down into, into the subsurface and fill up this groundwater space. Water is also being recharged from precipitation that's not used by plants. 
um, and in modern times also from irrigation water that's not used by plants. And where that groundwater first shows up, just when you keep filling up that basin, just like when you fill up that flower pot with dirt, is in the lowest spot. And that lowest spot is typically where our streams drain our well valleys. And so <clears throat> that, when that happens, then that's where we have the connection between groundwater and surface water. And if I keep filling up this, this sediment in this bathtub or, or the, the dirt in my flower pot, what I will create is a water table that actually slopes towards the river, which means groundwater is now flowing to the river and discharging into that river. This is what we call a gaining river, and that's a function of many rivers in the humid United States, in the Northeast, Midwest, and um, also in the Northwest. And this is a phenomenon that we've known for many, many times. And the surface water hydrologists, the, the folks on the engineering side that, that have done a lot of the early descriptions of how rivers work, um, they have always known that a hydrograph, which is a timeline of the flow rate in a stream um, over time, when it rains, stream, we all have this experience, when it rains, our streams flow much more rapid and have much more flow than when it doesn't rain. But when it doesn't rain, often it doesn't mean, most cases, it doesn't mean that streams stop flowing. In, in many streams in this country, Water will flow for days and months after it has stopped raining, which is what Dr. Stanford has referred to this morning as base flow. That base flow sustains our streams, is very important to ecology, and that's the contribution of groundwater. Um, that, that is the, the, the main contrib the contribution of groundwater to streams, and on real hydrographs it looks something like this, um, where you have these peaks that are generated by precipitation that generates direct runoff into streams, large amounts of runoff into streams that cause flooding or cause stream banks to be full. But between rainfalls, there's this lower flow regime that we refer to as base flow. Now, about 100 years ago, we started pumping our aquifer system. And so we're taking some of this water that would otherwise go to streams or to the riparian uh, vegetation that's near these streams, and we take that and we pump it out during times when we don't have precipitation and use it for irrigation and for urban water uses. And in the process, we create what we call a cone of depression around the wells that we're pumping. Um, and in California, um, in much of the uh, West Coast, with the semi-arid climate that we have, rain in the winter, drought basically every year in the summer, sort of a, 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 season, a seasonal dry, a dry season, um, we fill these uh, groundwater basins over the winter with recharge from precipitation, with recharge from our streams um, into spring, and then we pump them over the summer to irrigate our lawns and irrigate our crops. And this game goes back and forth. It doesn't really affect the water table in the long run unless the water that is withdrawn is more than is being replenished over the winter, in which case we um, have overdraft, what we call overdraft. Overdraft is a long-term imbalance in the amount of water that goes into an aquifer system and the amount of water that's being withdrawn from the aquifer system uh, by wells, um, um, going into streams, going to urban uses, or going to riparian vegetation. And pumping can then uh, lead to streams not gaining water, but actually losing water directly to these wells. So again, here an illustration of a gaining stream where the water table slopes toward the river, and then below that you have an image of a losing stream, what we call a losing stream, where the water table slopes away from the river and the river is actually recharging into, into the aquifer. Very common, uh, the latter, the bottom picture is very common when rivers first come out of the mountains. Does it change over the year, or the seasons? So the, the change over the season is essentially sort of um, this cartoon. So in the winter we tend to fill these cones of depressions with recharge, and then in the summer um, we, um, we have lower water table. And I mentioned earlier that groundwater flow is proportional to how much that water table slopes. And you can see on this picture that in the summer I have in fact a flatter slope towards the stream than in the winter. Which means during these summers when I do this pumping, I have less base flow going to the stream than I had in the days before irrigation when it was always sloping directly to the stream. So there are these seasonal changes in the contribution of groundwater to, um, 
two streams, and then there are long-term changes that can be caused by overdraft. So that's, that's sort of the essence of this groundwater stream interaction and how groundwater works. Now, I would like to bring these concepts into the Justice River Valley. In your report, Doctor, you talked about the headwaters are made, you talked about two kinds of aquifers. One was a fractured rock and the other is the alluvial. And the fractured rock was at the headwaters and below the valley and that water comes out in minimal quantities from those fractured rocks. Did I understand yes. your report correctly? Yes. So bring us into this alluvial aquifer with these kinds of concepts and, and what you have found in that specific valley. Okay, let me show this with some slides. So I'm bringing up the slide that Dr. Stanford showed earlier. Um, this is the uh, uh, Justice River watershed. Um, just to, to um, reinforce the description from Dr. Stanford, this is a very mountainous watershed and essentially lots of canyons. But this, the Justice River Valley is this um, large flat, ex flat expanse within this very mountainous system. It's about 20 miles long, 20, 25 miles long, and about five to six miles wide, um, which has come about because sediments have settled in, into that basin. So it actually is a flat area um, here, and this is a geologic cross-section. So your bathtub walls are right mm -hmm. here. These are the mountains. They hold water that moves very slowly. And then you have what we call alluvial fill, sands and gravels, some clay that's been deposited in this valley and that holds much of the groundwater that's being used in the valley um, almost exclusively for irrigation. Um, this is a map of the valley showing the uh, Justice River going through here and many different tributaries converging on this, on this particular valley. I will later show stream flow data that were uh, are taken right at the outlet of this valley, um, which is where we have the only long-term stream gauge here. A um, couple things to remember in terms of the water budget here. In an average year, and as you have heard earlier, there is a lot of variations in stream flows from a dry year to a wet year. But in an average year, we have about a half a million acre feet of water going through this valley to the ocean, 500,000 acre feet. Um, the uh, consumptive use, as was pointed out uh, earlier uh, by Council Sawyer, the consumptive use of the um, um, agricultural vegetation, of, of agriculture in this valley is about 95,000 acre feet, of which about three quarters is, is put on as irrigation water. So the irrigation water need in the valley is on the order of about 75,000 acre feet per year, which is a fraction of the total water flow in this particular system. That is an important detail to, to remember when we talk about remedies to low summer stream flows. On an annual basis, there's actually lots of water available um, uh, in, in that stream that ultimately makes it to the ocean um, that can be used for irrigation if there are ways to store it. So um, excuse me, Doctor, yeah. but in your report you talk about 1.28 million acre feet. Is that from the headwaters to the ocean? Yes. So if I take the, the watershed as a whole and I look at the entire amount of precipitation that's going onto this water sheet, watershed, then it's these 1.28 million acre feet, much of which actually stays in the soil of these mountainous lands and is taken up by the trees and then evaporated. The stream, the 500,000 acre feet that come down the Scott River is that part of the precipitation that's not captured by the soil for evapotranspiration by the native vegetation in the uplands. Um, and is available for and supports uh, the various habitats that we have in the stream and that has been supporting the agriculture in this valley for the last 100 years. Thank you. So in this valley, your report has told us that the pumping of groundwater has reduced the river flows. And would you um, remind us or just refresh our recollection in your report of how this came to be? Okay, so, yeah, let, let me do that. And let me talk a little bit more about this agricultural land use in this valley. So these are some images from this valley. We had mining uh, that started in the 1850s for gold and, and silver, which um, created some major land use changes in the very southern part of this valley, um, really actually destroyed the floodplain in, in, in the uh, uppermost uh, two miles of this valley. 
Um, we have the valley, in the valley itself, we had traditionally both pasture and alfalfa grown um, um, initially by flood irrigation. Uh, these meadows, uh, these pastures are getting flood irrigated um, directly from the uh, tributaries. Uh, we've had construction of some irrigation canals in this valley over uh, half a century ago to deliver um, stream water to these meadows for flood irrigation. Then in the 1960s and 70s, um, here's a map uh, that shows in yellow where we have alfalfa growing and in green where we have pasture growing, each, each about 15,000 acre feet. The green and the yellow areas are the areas that are irrigated. Um, in the 1960s and 70s, many of the alfalfa irrigators in particular um, were put on, were, uh, volunteered to use much more efficient irrigation systems. They went from flood irrigation to uh, wheel line sprinkler irrigation. Um, these wheel lines need to be pressurized, um, and in order to pressurize them, um, farmers needed pumps. And once they needed a pump, it was actually easier for them to just drill a well um, next to their fields and take the water out of a well that is from groundwater, rather than waiting for the irrigation district to deliver the water to their field for flood irrigation. Um, so the, the conversion to this much more efficient irrigation system um, actually introduced the use of groundwater into this valley. Um, and, it, uh, and it was partly because they needed a pump anyway, so it wasn't ec for economic reasons. It was partly because now all of a sudden they were not dependent on that surface water to deliver, to deliver uh, water to their field. Surface water typically ends up being at very low flows, as we've seen earlier, by the time early July comes around. Um, so, sort of the, the rule of thumb in the valley is by 4th of July, the stream kind of stops flowing. It's, it's, it goes to these really low flows that are below 100 CFS. And at that point, many of the uh, irrigators used to actually stop irrigation. And what micros, the, these wheel lines allowed them that were hooked to groundwater wells, uh, it allowed the alfalfa growers to have three cuts of alfalfa instead of two cuts of alfalfa. So starting in the 1970s, they actually were able to increase the amount of alfalfa they could harvest from their fields because they used groundwater instead of surface water. But did that also increase the consumptive use of the water? So that would have increased the consumptive use of the water if you have alfalfa standing in your, in your field for another six weeks, four to six weeks. That means additional evapotranspiration from that alfalfa into the atmosphere, yes. But if you had this bucket of water and you were flood irrigating and a lot went back and now you're using a more efficient system and getting another crop, you're actually ending up using more of that water over the season? That is correct. I'm using more of the water over the season. I'm also, because I'm very efficient in the irrigation I do, I'm doing, I'm also not replenishing the soil profile and recharging the groundwater in ways it would be under meadow irrigation, under flood irrigation, uh, which is very inefficient, meaning that actually much of the water that's being delivered to the, to, to the field moves through the root zone and recharges the groundwater. Um, and that recharge is getting lost. So we have these wells um, that um, have been put into, into this Justice River system and we see this impact um, when we look at water levels in Justice River Valley. Um, we have, in the winter, uh, we have higher water levels and in the summer we have lower water levels. But one of the other things we see, there's not really an overdraft. We haven't, over the last eight years of this particular record on on wells that have been observed since 2007, we don't see drastic reductions in water levels in the long term. Water levels do recover on an annual basis. The drought, if I do some statistics on this, the drought has in the summertime, um, the, average, the average water levels on these wells during the summertime shown here um, from 2006 to 2014, during drought periods, we do see slight decreases on the order of about two to three feet overall over these three, four year droughts that we've had in the late 2000s and currently, um, which then in turn leads to smaller base flow to the stream. So, 
Um, let me see how I want to put this. I think you've addressed how drought affects stream flow, but if, did you have more that you would like to add to that? Maybe I could add, one of the things that has happened in the Scott Valley actually in the last 15 years is that farmers have become even more efficient in their irrigation system. They move from these wheel lines to what, what we call center pivots um, and actually increase their efficiency by another 20%. Um, which means that the total amount of water that they, they take, they, that they use for irrigation today is significantly less than the amount of irrigation that was used, say, in the 1950s or 60s when these fields were flood irrigated. But as you pointed out, the consumptive use of water actually has increased because of the longer um, growing, growing period on the alfalfa fields. So do you think climate change is going to affect what we're going to see in this river, how it flows? Yes, let Do me you go. Believe in climate change? <laughs> <laughs> Not to put you on the spot. <laughs> but climate, I don't, climate change, I don't think is a matter of belief. It's a matter of fact. And if you look at our records, we certainly can see that <laughs> climate change happens. Um, and how do you so, anticipate we're going to see that in this? Basis? Yes. Um, so we have seen in, in the Justice River Valley that stream flows, this is the stream flow record from 1941 when we had the first stream gauge um, installed just at the outlet of the Justice River Valley. Um, these are the stream flows um, that uh, have been recorded since then. Um, and what you can see is that stream flows almost every winter exceed 1,000 CFS. Uh, which was one of the numbers that uh, Dr. Stanford pointed out this, uh, earlier in his earlier testimony. And there are a number of years where we exceed uh, stream flows of, or have stream flows of over 10,000 10, CFS during major uh, flood events. The other thing that's apparent from this graph, and the blue line is the actual um, stream flow, the orange in the background is the average the average daily stream flow, so it repeats itself, every, the orange line repeats itself for every year on this, on this record. Um, what we see is that the low flows in the summer seem to have decreased over the last 60 years substantially, and some people would draw sort of a, a downward line here. I'm, I'm drawing two lines here, sort of a period prior to the conversion to wheel lines, and then a period since uh, that starts sort of at the, with the time that we've had these wheel line sprinkler irrigation, the time when we started groundwater pumping. And there seems to be a difference of about 30 CFS in that stream flow. And your question as to climate change, um, let me illustrate this a little bit more and just kind of focus on, on, so on this summer low flow period. So these are average stream flows here in black. This is the historic flows in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s prior to having any groundwater wells online. In uh, blue is the period between the 1960s and the 1990s. And in uh, red, we have the uh, most recent period, which was, uh, had pronounced series of droughts. Can I ask you to go back a slide, please? To which one? Go back just one yeah. slide. In looking at this slide, it looks like 1990 to, let's say, 95 that we're getting more years of low flow than we did historically? Am I yes. interpreting that correctly? Yes, so we've Longer had- Longer periods, I guess. Yeah, let me, let me jump forward to another slide that I have here. If we look at drought periods in, in this region, what you can see is in red, um, this is a, a calendar that starts in 1905, and it shows water years as either wet in blue, normal in green, orange and red for dry years, and it goes from 1906 to 2014. And what I've framed here with these red boxes are periods of drought. We had a very, um, we had several, a series of droughts in the 1920s, early 1930s, that's the, the bottom box, and we've had a number of droughts since the um, late 1980s. So that period that you pointed out, from 1988 to 1993, was a um, series of um, dry years, and we've had several other periods of dry years, uh, much more so than we had in the period between 1940 and 1985. And our stream gauging all starts, the, one, the stream gauging records that we have actually start after this particular uh, dry period. And so some of this is, is um, climate change. Um, 
we have higher temperatures that is attributed to climate change. And with these higher temperatures, we also have in an earlier snow melt. And as a result, we get some of these winter flows that were stored in the snow for snow melt runoff in the spring, now not in April or May, but already in February and March. And that's evident in this graph, um, which shows the um, April through July stream flows in a neighboring basin that's actually much larger than the Justice River Valley. And it shows the decline in stream flows that we have in the later spring because of that earlier snow melt runoff. So these are pieces of evidence that show the impacts of climate change regardless of this pumping. And as Dr. Stanford pointed out, there's been some studies that have looked at the actual impact of climate change and tried to sort of sort out how much of this signal is because of climate change and how much of this, this lower stream flow that we have in the Justice River Valley is because of pumping. Um, and let me go back to what Dr. Stanford pointed out. Historically, between <coughs> July and no, July 1 and October 31st, the, blacks, the, the, uh, the, the black line at the top uh, was, is the average historic flow during the summer. And as you see it earlier in the winter, it goes actually way back up and then comes back down the next spring. Um, this particular study looked at neighboring river systems to look at how the, Scott, the, the Justice River would have behaved under climate influence alone, and that's this thick black line. So under climate change influence, this is based on statistical analysis in comparison to neighboring basins, how climate change impacts this, the Justice River. The actual observation of stream flow in the Justice River is this dotted line. Now what's interesting is that in September and October, how the, just, the Justice River now behaves is entirely dictated by climate change according to this analysis. Whereas in July and August, um, the impact of climate change is actually fairly limited, um, and yet the Justice River has uh, significantly lower flows during that period. So the irrigation impact seems to be predominantly during July and August, whereas climate change impact is what we see in September and October. Um, the um, conclusion in this study was that 60% is due to irrigated farming and 40%, about 40% of this lower flows are uh, due to climate change, but that's an average over this entire period, which is an important period from, from a fish perspective. Now, another study showed that uh, in September specifically, um, they were able to show that September flows can be explained largely by the snowpack in the, in the uh, Justice River watershed, in the upper Justice River watershed. And they show that that snowpack, in fact, has declined, and that's directly correlated with um, September stream flows. Um, their conclusion was that 80% of the reduction in September stream flows are, in fact, due to climate change. Now, looking at this with these dates in mind, it's actually, it actually, we can see that these two studies don't collide. It seems that they collide because one says 80% and the other one says 30% is due to climate change. But it's that we have to look at the timing. It's in fact uh, large re uh, largely in September and October low flows are largely due to climate change. In July and August they're largely due to irrigation. So Dr. Harder we're going to be running out of time here shortly but could you please outline some actions you think that could be taken to increase stream flows to facilitate salmon recovery? Yes. So in principle, we have a lot of water in the winter, uh, some of which we need to, as Dr. Stanford pointed out, we need to make available to flush out the system, to regenerate these ecosystems, to provide habitat for, for the salmon. Um, and then we have these very low flow periods in the summer that are exacerbated, exacerbated by both climate change and irrigation. Um, the solution in one way or another is to store some of that water that we have in, in the really wet period and make it available during, during a drier period. And that, that becomes even more important as we lose some of the other storage we have in this basin, which is the snowpack. And so one of the storage places uh, would be in the, in the groundwater aquifer. And to explain that, let me, let me briefly illustrate what happens uh, near a stream when we have a well. So the relation, basically I want to show the relationship between when I'm withdrawing water from a well and when that water may be impacting the base flow to the stream. I start pumping this well 
And initially, I will have a cone of depression near that well that will not really affect the slope of the water table near the stream, meaning it doesn't really impact how much base flow I have to the stream. Um, as I continue pumping, I may be lowering the, the, uh, the slope of this water table, make, make, make it flatter, which means I get less space flow into the, the stream, all the way to the point where that stream actually may be losing water to the well. The key point here is that there is a delay between starting the pumping and when I impact the stream, and also a delay between when I stop pumping and when I impact that stream. Um, and so, if I just simply reduce the pumping, the, um, the impact of that, of that may not be necessarily directly in the summer months. The impact of that might be in later months, but it's one of the scenarios that we've looked at. So we've looked at this time delay on all of the irrigation wells in the Scott Valley. And you can see this, the, uh, the number that's on here, very roughly speaking, and I'm simplifying the, the um, particular tool that we've used here, um, is the number on these wells um, is the number of days needed to impact, to impact the stream in ways where about half of the well water now is reduced, is, is, is from the stream, or is half of the flow in the well is the reduction in the Justice River. That was a question I had for you, Dr. Harder. In your report, you talked about pumping within a mile corridor pumping further from the river, having a time delay. How and why and on what basis did you pick that mile corridor? Um, the mile corridor was based on, on this map, in fact. If you, can, if you look at this map, um, very roughly speaking, within about a mile, half a mile to a mile from the uh, Justice River, the uh, number on these wells is somewhere between 0 and 10 or 10 and 100. This is corresponding to about a three-month period, meaning the impact on the stream uh, will be felt within days to a couple of months. And this would be different for different streams? And this would be different for, um, uh, depending on how far a, a well is from the stream. So the further away a well is from the stream, the longer, the more time will go by before the stream feels the impact of the well. And how did you determine that stream depletion function? So in this particular case, we used a, what I would call a physical model. So unlike in the previous studies that I showed where climate change was investigated, where a statistical method was used to look at this as a black box and says, we see, we make these observations, we have these stream flows, let's connect it with some statistics. What I do here is I say, well, I'm going to look at the physics, the water physics in this box. I look at the hydraulic conductivity and the thickness of the aquifer, the storage capacity of this aquifer, and the distance between the well and the stream. Um, there have been people that have come up with um, mathematical models somewhat simplified, somewhat simplifying the systems, but no longer just a black box, that relates the pumping in a well to when that is felt in the stream and how much of it is felt in the stream. This is what we call, in this particular case, we use what's called the Glover solution to calculate these days. But your model needed real world data to put in that Glover solution. My model needed real world data, so in this bottle, this particular model is what I would call sort of a simple analytical model, relies on average aquifer properties, not on specific location aquifer properties, but it sort of averages the properties across this entire basin and on average storage properties of this, of this system. But it, it does, in fact, rely on, on, on actual uh, properties to, to make that clear. Now, in terms of the solutions, to go back to your question. Thank you. I was just going to talk yeah. to you back there. So there, the, one of them is to reduce groundwater pumping. Another one is to actually use that same delay effect that we have for pumping, but for recharge. So if I can, if I pump, and it's 50 days before the stream feels it. And this is a gradual change. It's not nothing for 50 days and then suddenly. It's a gradual change. I'm just putting this sort of as a, 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 a to give a time dimension. I can also add water to the aquifer somewhere away from the stream and then have the stream feel that impact at some later time. And what we'd like to do in, this, in the Justice River Valley is we'd like to take some of the winter water and the spring water from, that's available in the stream 
and put it in the aquifer, and with that delay, perhaps that would increase stream flow three months later. In order to check on that, we actually built a, um, we built an integrated hydrologic model. So this is now a complex computer model that reflects everything we know about this valley. It reflects the particular shape of the valley. It reflects the detailed stratigraphy, uh, the detailed geology of these sediments in the valley. It reflects the presence of these streams and the canals, the variability in the crops, the daily changes in irrigation, the daily changes in the map of transpiration. Putting all of this together takes a significant amount of time and a lot of data, not all of which we actually have available and where we don't have them available, it takes some professional second guessing or professional estimation based on how things happen in nearby places. But the model performs really well. So part of the exercise of this modeling um, is to build confidence that this toolbox actually gives us something that's reasonable. And so if we recreate reality of the last 20 years and we look at what the model predicts in terms of where the water table is and how that compares to observed water table elevations, it does actually pretty well. And when we do that comparison for stream flow, especially for the low summer flows, this model actually does very well. So this is this, is, um, this model calibration exercise that we went through was a way for us to say, well, let's take this tool that we built where we put all of our knowledge of this basin into this computer model and actually run it for the last 20 years and see whether it can predict the flows that we have seen, whether it can predict the water table elevation variations that we have seen. So can I take these models as certain answers? Um, is there certainty uh, yes. built into these? So there's, this, 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 is, this, is, um, this is part of the certainty that's built into this. Key drivers, the, key drivers that drive these models, think of them as a, as a, as a fancy box um, where we describe within the box, which is our aquifer system, we describe things like the hydraulic conductivity and how it changes within that box. We describe the storativity of the aquifer and how it changes within that box. We also provide information on what the connection is between the aquifer and the stream. Um, we provide information on how much recharge may be coming from irrigation or how much recharge may be coming from precipitation. Um, and some of these numbers we know very precisely. Some of these numbers, we have a range of estimates. Some of these numbers we don't know very well. And the numbers that we know the least are the what numbers that I then sit down once I have this tool created in my computer, I can start turning the knobs on these numbers. And it's typically the hydraulic conductivity and the storativity. And I, I can turn these knobs until I get a good fit to this model. And part to, to, the, to the data that I have. This is not really magic, but what I'm actually using the tool for is I'm saying I have more data, namely flows in the stream and water level measurements, that I haven't explicitly put into the model, but I'm actually having the model provide this. I'm now using the fact that I have these and I turn these knobs within the ranges that I think are reasonable from my hydrogeologic uh, professional judgment. Um, to help me sort of refine this tool. But the other thing that I can then do with this toolbox is I can say, well, there's a number of different things in this that I've put into this model, a number of different parameters or boundary conditions that I'm not 100% sure of. I, I, I go down and I sit down and I say, here's the ones that I'm not sure of. The range that I think is reasonable, the low end of where I think hydraulic conductivity is and the high end of where hydraulic conductivity is, or one way to do the stream canal interaction and the other way to do stream canal interaction is I write this down and I say, okay, I'm gonna run this model with a, ra with a range of these parameters and I compare the results. And if it turns out that I can pick whatever from these ranges and I always get this really good fit, then I know that actually it doesn't matter what these parameters are. I know enough about the system to reproduce how the system behaves relatively well. And I'm sorry, Dr. Herter, I'm going to have to get you to wrap up here. I'm cutting into Council's time, but um, what options would you recommend that we take? So we have the option to do recharge in, in the, uh, in, uh, out, of the, out of these rivers. Um, in the spring, when we have lots of stream flows, we can do recharge away from the river um, during winter. Uh, that's one option that we um, evaluated, and it gives us about 
four to five CFS extra stream flow in September. Um, we can do what we call in lieu recharge. In lieu recharge meaning that instead of taking water from the groundwater during the spring period when we have lots of stream flow available, we take that stream flow and use it for irrigation. So we go back to the olden days when we, have, when we uh, use surface water for irrigation. Um, at least during the early part of the growing season. That gives us about 5 to 15 CFS during that critical period in August, September, and October, in addition to what normally would flow in the river. Another option are beaver dams, as Dr. Stanford mentioned, that raises actually the water table in the groundwater adjacent to the streams, which would then provide also additional water in the late summer when we have these low flows. And then last but not least, the difference in these low flows amounts to about 6,000 acre feet. Um, we could use some storage reservoir in the upper headwaters that stores something on that order, maybe somewhat larger, to actually then provide that in lieu of um, drawing the stream down or to put it directly into the stream to um, undo these lower flows. And one final question, then we'll move on to you, Councillor. Um, what's your opinion of the relative availability of these water management options to meet Dr. Stanford's objectives? The, Can we ever get to 500 CFS? So what I'm showing here is that um, you know, we're talking about fixing a diff perhaps the difference between what thing, how things were like in the 1950s and 60s versus how they've been in the last 30 years. We're talking about a difference of 30 CFS. Um, we don't know what stream flows were before mining and agriculture came into the valley in the 1800s. Um, but it's unlikely that those stream flows were ever in the summer, um, on an average, much more than 100 CFS, 200 CFS at the very most. I'm not sure that given uh, the current infrastructure in the valley, um, we can go to much more than uh, 20 or 30 or 40 CFS. What we get from in lieu recharge is about 15 CFS. What we get from recharge in the winter away from the stream is maybe five CFS. And that can be done very readily. Um, we're still evaluating how much we can, how much additional stream flows we may have if we allow beaver dams to be uh, coming back. Um, and the um, building the reservoir in the headwaters, there's a number of other issues involved with that. Um, I'm not sure how quickly that can be done, but it's certainly an option that could be considered and, and moved forward with. Thank you, Dr. Harder. I appreciate your testimony. Councillor Maraschino. <laughs> I'm not even going to try. <laughs> Cross examination, please. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Dr. Harder. Good afternoon. Um, again, Joan Marchioro. I've been represented, uh, or retained by the families that have farmed for generations in the Justice River Valley and asked to represent them in this litigation and to protect their historic way of life. Um, have you had a chance to go up to the Justice River Valley and view those farms? Yes. Those families? Okay. Yes. So you've, you've seen what, it's very beautiful. What, what's, at, what's at stake here. Correct. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about your model. I, I think I heard a couple different things in your testimony. I'm a little, a little confused now. <clears throat> I was more confused, I'm a little more enlightened, but I'm still a little bit confused. Did you create the model? Yes, the model was created in our research group. Okay, and I thought, I heard you say that you've been running the model for, for 20 years. Yes. Okay, has it changed over time? Um, yes, so what you see in, 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 these, in these predictions of how, when, when we make these predictions for, for how in lieu recharge would work, what we actually do is, we pretend these things were in place over the last 20 years, and we rerun the model that we had calibrated on real-world data under real-world conditions for conditions as they existed between 1990 and 2011, including the dry years and including the wet years. Um, and we rerun these scenarios, and you can see that depending on which year we're in, we have different results. In a, in a wet year, um, we get relatively high uh, impacts from this Indu recharge in dry years like uh, 1998 or 2009, we get, no, actually, it's the opposite way. I apologize. In really wet years, we have, these projects would have relatively little impact. It's in dry years where these projects have the most impact. 
Okay. So you talked about turning knobs and, and doing things. How many how many data points are used to calibrate the model? Um, so let me let me back up a little bit. When we create these models, they are based on mathematical equations, and the mathematical equations uh, they there are parameters that describe the properties of the aquifer system and what the boundaries that drive the fluxes that go in and out of the water, um, out of this system. The model then calculates for me the stream flows, the aquifer flows, and also the, the, the dynamic changes of the water table. That's what the model output is. Now, I do have measurements of both water table from a network of wells that's been in place since 2007. And I have these stream flow measurements that I showed since 1941. Um, and I, I don't put those into the model. That's not what the model requires me to do. But it, it allows me, gives me the opportunity to compare my model output, my modeled water table dynamics, my modeled stream flow with these data. So we have actually daily data from 1990 uh, to 2011 for stream flow, which we used for this comparison. And we have monthly data on about 40 wells from 2007 to, 2000, to, to current that we also used in this modeling exercise for comparison. Well, my recollection is that the, the, the wells upon which that modeling data is based are secret. So how, how much confidence would someone other than yourself, do you know where those wells are located? Yes, so we have actual knowledge of the well location and we're working with a private organization that um, co um, collects these water level data. Uh, we make internally sure that there is uh, quality control on the collection of these data. Um, but yeah, but so we can't make those public because it's a private monitoring system and the homeowners um, have agreed to only participate in this program if the data stay private. I'm just trying to get to, you know, to the bottom line of what, what's your level of confidence? You've got a variety of, of uh, inputs that are, you have uh, real world data you can use as a comparison, but what, it sounds like what you're putting into the model are hypothetical numbers and then you're turning knobs and you have secret wells. And you're, you know, what I've got is individuals who are farming and they want right. to continue to farm and they've right. got generations that want to continue farming and it seems as though we've got I, it's you know it's a black box at best but maybe worse than a black box from their perspective so tell me yeah. based on your experience what's your confidence level in the numbers you've derived based on these models and you know, kind of secret numbers so so the confidence level that i have in in this is less perhaps expressed in in, uh, in, in this, although this is a very important part of, of our confidence building. Um, and I, I want to, I want to um, correct, I didn't say that we use hypothetical numbers. I said we use, a, a, in, in cases where we don't have data for the hydraulic conductivity, for example, or for storage coefficient, we have other, we have other related information. We know the geologic material. We have aquifer tests. Um, we have well logs, borehole logs that were made available to us that we could use to look at this geologic material. Again, materials. secret data because we don't. Get um, the, no, not, not these are not the secret. Well those are okay. those are the, yes, those are the secret data that we were made av uh, available of because it was um, under state contract, um, and so. Um, but the, um, in, in terms of the water level data that we have from this, what you call secret monitoring uh, program, they actually, we have published the data, we've published the statistical analysis, we've uh, shown long-term trends, we've published maps. So it's not that, it, that this is a very uh, secret program. The part that is confidential is the exact location of the wells. It, do you have, what, can you tell me the, the number of wells? I don't, I don't recall. There's about 40 wells in this monitoring program. Given the size of the Justice River Valley and the, the agricultural uh, acres, is that a sufficient number of data points in your, in your line of work? I would like to have more data points, <laughs> um, but it is, it is a starting point that probably exceeds um, the density of data uh, for most um, similar modeling exercises that have been done in and around California. So from, from, 
you know, as a modeler, we always want more data. So that's, that's part of uh, the piece to keep in mind. Yet, we can provide some fundamental analyses off of these models, and we can use the uncertainty that we may have with respect to you know, how real these water levels are, or how real the properties of the aquifers are, and we can do exercises like this one, where we look at, well, how does my output change? How does my recharge change? How does my simulated pumping change? How does my, um, my stream gain or stream loss change over time if I change my parameters within the range that I think is reasonable? And so, for example, for the hydraulic conductivity, I'm looking at the net stream gain or losses from pumping. If, my, if I chose a hydraulic conductivity in my model that was one-tenth of what I have chosen, which I think is sort of at the very extreme low end, then my stream gain in August and September is maybe 20 CFS for this particular scenario. Um, if I were to make it twice as large as I've chosen for the blue line, then I get maybe five CFS extra. So I get a range of predictions. So this is how I address the fact that not everything is certain in this model. I actually use the information that I have and the uncertainty. I quantify the uncertainty in the information I have. And I use that to make predictions that are not one number, but that give me the range that I expect across these scenarios. So I think given the uncertainty I have about my model parameters, um, but given the certainty that I have from correlated information, like the well locks, given that I only have 40 wells from which I have water level measurements and not more, but given those 40 uh, wells with monthly water level measurements, um, I, would, I would say that with, with significant certainty I can say between these various projects that involve recharge or reduced pumping, I can perhaps produce an additional 5 to 50 CFS in August and September of stream flow in the river. Nailing that down further does require additional data to be collected to make that happen. And what would that additional data be? So that additional data <coughs> would be um, primarily more, more data that actually describe the properties of the aquifer system, the storage properties and hydraulic conductivity of the aquifer system. Um, I'm not sure um, additional monitoring wells where I monitor water level elevations would help, uh, would help greatly. There are some areas within the valley where I have fewer monitoring wells than in other areas. I would fill those in with additional um, data. One of the <coughs> critical pieces that I think um, we're missing here and that we're missing in many other places um, around uh, California is we have one stream gauging station here and we're basing a lot of our confidence in this model on this one stream gauging station. We actually know very little about the surface water flows that come into the valley. Um, in our model, we, have, we provided these surface water inflows um, based on data off of about a handful of stream gauging stations that have been in place for limited periods of time sometime in the last 30 year period. So one of the key pieces that I think we need to get, make better predictions is understanding what stream flow actually goes into the valley. Um, and other pieces that, that relates to what Dr. Stanford said, to really understand the connection to the biology. Um, you know, I, I can say, I can, you know, from a modeling perspective, I think we can increase with these various options we have, we can increase stream flow in August and September, even in a dry year, by somewhere between five and 50 CFS. But do we have to answer to whether or not this helps the biology? I think what Dr. Stanford said, what I heard Dr. Stanford say is there's also a significant amount of uncertainty about how exactly that connection between groundwater and surface water and these additional stream flows really help the fish, given in particular that in July and August, there doesn't seem to be any fish that need that water. So in the, in the model that your uh, unit has prepared, and use over the last 20 years. Um, has it been revised? Over, I, I apologize, I can't remember. Had you, had you speak it, up, has the model been revised over time? Yeah, so we've started with, with um, <coughs> the, the initial relatively simple model that was based on understanding the water budget on each of the fields in the 
Justice River Valley, and on this stream depletion function, which is a, an analytical tool, basically a tool that we can use in a spreadsheet. Um, we have built this much more complex numerical model, and we have done improvements on that model over the past three years um, by using um, more sophisticated ways to represent the interaction between the stream and groundwater. There's different toolboxes available there. They're actually sub-models within that model um, by better representing the, um, the irrigation canals that are in the valley. So we've, we've made updates on that um, to get to a closer representation of the hydrology in the Justice River Valley. And do you anticipate that the model will need to be changed further in the future? Ideally, these models are living toolboxes. What these models represent are, it's, it's, the, it's the sum of the knowledge that's been created through data collection, through geologic in, uh, investigations, through hydraulic observations in, in the Justice River Basin. And what this model represents is a physically coherent, a piece where I put all these puzzle pieces together in a physically coherent manner that represents the physics of groundwater flow and of stream flow. And it can never be perfect. Ideally, we take this model, we take the uncertainty, we identify where do we need to collect data to reduce the uncertainty that we currently have. If the decision is that this is too much uncertainty to make a policy decision or make a law decision. Take this uncertainty and say, okay, there's places we need to measure. And we can identify that with the model. We can say there are certain areas where we need more data. Collect those data and then improve the model. Even if we move forward with this project, ideally we monitor the impacts of a project on both stream flows and water table. And we take that information back into the, into the model to improve on that model. So it's actually a, an adaptive management approach where the interaction between model, between management, and data collection is a continuous loop. So if my clients are, are required to reduce their use in the near term, and yet you need, still need to gather more data to refine and make your model outputs more accurate, how, how is it that you can um, reach conclusions that take into account that my clients have now been, whether they need to or not, depending on your confidence right. in the model, are being required to reduce their use of, of right. water for irrigation. That, that, I think that's a, that's, a, that's a key question, but I'm not the person <laughs> to decide that question. That's really before the court um, to weigh in on the uncertainty. I can't reduce the uncertainty that there is. No model can reduce this uncertainty. <clears throat> we think we put together what we know in the best possible manner. We can present this and show you the uncertainty. And now, uh, we must leave it to the courts to weigh in on how to take that uncertainty in the decision process that the courts make, um, or that may be made by, by an agency locally at later at that, um, in that place. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna change to the, to the climate change uh, discussion ask you a few questions about that. So you, you pointed out some of the differences that we've seen in your report with respect to the various results of, of studies and the American Water Resources Association uh, claimed or reached a conclusion that 39% of the, the loss of water in the Justice River system was due to climate change. The Journal of Ca the Journal of California said it was 80%. You have narrowed that to September, I'll accept that. Uh, but the State Department of Water Resources said that a significant decreases in spring flow is due to climate change. So it, isn't your proposal regarding the reduced use of groundwater pumping by the family farmers requiring them to bear the burden of more than their fair share of the loss of water in the Justice River? So just to clarify, I'm not proposing any one of these solutions. I'm saying here are some ways that we can increase the low flows in July, August, and September. Reduction of pumping, increase of recharge in the spring and winter to refill our aquifer so we have more water available from, for base flow in August and September. Or building an um, external storage, surface water storage that we can use to augment stream flows in August and September. Um, 
it is up to the court to decide which of these options or whether to pick any of these options or whether it couldn't be a combination of these options. Um, and that decision is a decision that also, there's economic, as you point out, there are economic um, implications to consider. There's ecologic uh, implications to consider. That's not my job to make the decision. What I'm saying is here are options that are available to us that I think are reasonable to consider. And here is what we can reasonably expect to happen when we implement these options. OK. Well, let's, let's say you are the judge. Um, and I think it's fair for, for the judge to be not just looking at you for scientific analysis, but to get a, a rank ordering of what, what would be What's the most effective? And, and if you've done any uh, economic studies on that, what's the most effective? What's the biggest bang for your buck, so to speak? I don't, I don't feel qualified to judge that, because I, I lack both the legal and the economic knowledge, um, as well as the ecological knowledge <clears throat> on that. I think that really is um, that's beyond my capacity. So in terms of in your report, you, you had a, curt a curtailment option. I don't recall it being discussed on your slides. Um, so under your, if you remember your curtailment option A, yes, would all pumping at some wells uh, have to cease under that curtailment option? You know, in in the most primitive form, a curtailment option would set a date and apply that curtailment to all the wells. Uh, certainly, the tools that we have available would allow us to actually be much more sophisticated and evaluate. Um, and we've done that in the, um, with, the, uh, with the first tool that I showed you. We've, we've actually looked at a number of different ways to cur do curtailment, uh, different types of different months to focus the curtailment on, different types of wells, the ones that are only close to the stream, the ones that are all, all far away from the stream, to demonstrate how that would impact stream flows in, in July, August, and September. So that, in, that is information that, uh, that the court can take into consideration in making a decision on the tools that are, on, on, on the options that are available. So in terms of, um, I heard you say all, all wells, I thought I understood from your report that selected wells would be turned off, and, if, and how would you choose which farmers you were going to tell they had to no longer use water? Yeah, that is outside of my professional capacity to decide. So under your plan, could the farmers that, um, could those farmers that were required to cease groundwater diversions or, or pumping uh, switch to surface water irrigation to continue to irrigate their field? What, what we are showing with the tools that, that we have built is that during the parts of the spring when surface, ex excess surface water um, is available, if farmers near the stream can switch to surface water irrigation during that period, perhaps even do an additional irrigation above and beyond the needs of the crop, we do gain significant stream flows in July, August, and September, even if they do switch then to groundwater pumping. So in terms of, uh, I don't recall from your report, there was a description of the valley floor where the farming is occurring and what amount of recharge might be gained, what type of the soil situation there is located there. Did you do any analysis of the valley floor in terms of its hydrology or uh, geology to, to determine? So for example, um, there was a discussion of uh, cattle and grazing and is there, and to the extent whether there's, I don't know what the volume of cattle is right off the top of my head, but in, in terms of, say, soil compaction, if they're, if they're stomping around in the wrong locations, is there certain types of land use choices that my clients have made that, short of stopping irrigating, that can be done that you might gain some amount of recharge during the, the year? We did at this point not consider any changes in land use or any different types of crops. Um, that has not been part of our analysis to this point. So no, no crop rotation laying fallow certain parts of the valley? Not anything outside of, of what's currently being done. Dr. Harder, you need to let her finish her question so the record can get it. I'm used to uh, that. Don't worry. That's okay. Um, so with, with climate change constituting a, a significant part of the problem, 
we'll call it the problem. Uh, isn't a reservoir the most flexible solution to address this issue? Again, that's, that's beyond my, my professional capacity to judge because it's not just a hydrologic question. That's also an ecologic question and economic question. Okay. So you, you've talked about uh, CFS on the order of 5 to 50. And I, I, as I listened to Dr. Stanford, he had, he had another zero uh, at the end of the 50. And I'm, I'm trying to understand uh, how your recommendations fit in with his uh, rather large 500 CFS, and, and aren't we just going to continue to, if that's the number the judge thinks is appropriate, how, how, do, how do we ever get to that based on your understanding of this uh, system? So based, based on taking all of the various data that we have put together in this hydrologically, physically very consistent framework, which we call a groundwater model or integrated hydrologic model, um, and, and whether it's the more simplified analytical version or the more complex version, there doesn't seem to be any reason to think that we can get the system ever to a place where it produces, on average, stream flow that far exceeds 50 CFS in July, August, and September. It's physically not possible to do that. So these beavers you guys have been talking about, have you done an analysis of whether there are any available and willing beavers that want to move to the, the Justice River and start building dams? There are actually, fun, funny to ask, there are, there are, there are, there is a research project in place uh, and has been in place for the last couple of years to reestablish beaver in the Justice River system. And um, there are, there are a significant amount of monitoring that's uh, being proposed to start next year to look at the um, impacts on groundwater tables near beaver dams, um, look at the ecology of these beaver dams and how they also how to behave in the long term because we have these flushing flows in the winter and they don't typically survive um, larger floods. Um, are there, uh, in your beaver dam scenario, uh, what's the potential for property damage? I'm not familiar with beaver dams and property damage um, at this point. That's, that's a biologist question. Okay. <laughs> um. <clears throat> Trying to see if I have anything left. Anything? From the crowdsourcing? No. Um, well, I think that concludes my questioning. I, I tried to pin him down, and he resisted. So thank you very much, Dr. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Counselor. Thank you, Dr. Harder. You may be excused, you, and with Honor. that, the matter will be de deemed submitted to the court. It will be off the record. So you can do as much as you want or as little as you want. You're okay, good question. Reporting back, you're reporting back on the bus tomorrow. So your leader is doing, what you need to help your leader do is give them talking points. And what are you gonna say about just the basics? You don't need to go into a whole lot, but a little bit about why those and the judgment you make, a little bit about that. We're looking for maybe five minutes, that's all. So not, not very much, but if you'll spend a lot of time thinking it. You know, if you catch your leader tomorrow, you may say, and one more thing, or not. Um, but, uh, so thank you, and I want to thank possible leaders.